Islam, y'all. Salam alaikum. Black oppression. Let's talk about it. These people are creating a terrible problem in our cities. They can't or won't hold a job. They flout the law constantly and neglect their children. They drink too much, and their moral standards would shame an alley cat. For some reason or other, they absolutely refuse to accommodate themselves to any kind of decent, civilized life. This was said in 1956 in Indianapolis, not about blacks or other minorities, but about poor whites from the South. Nor was Indianapolis unique in this respect. A 1951 survey in Detroit found that white Southerners living there were considered undesirable by 21% of those surveyed, compared to 13% who ranked blacks the same way. In the late 1940s, a Chicago employer said frankly, I told the guard at the plant gate to tell the hillbillies that there were no openings. When poor whites from the South moved into northern cities to work in war plants during the Second World War, Occasionally, a white southerner would find that a flat or a furnished room had just been rented when the landlord heard his southern accent. The origin of redneck culture. Hold on a second. <clears throat> Greetings, folks. Islam, salam alaikum, alhamdulillah, mashallah. What we listen to in the background is the elder Thomas Soul, and this is from... The Hoover Institute channel, that's Thomas Sowell's channel. This one on my Ad Bucks commercial right now, so I'm using that time to explain what's going on in the background. And that's open to the public, and I'm not using that <coughs> to create revenue. YouTube don't pay me, they're not my boss. So they can't tell me how to express myself, my First Amendment right. And I'm sharing something that's already public, all right? So this is how law works. If you don't establish who and what you are, somebody will assume and establish it for you. This is how you lose all your God-given rights. So let me start this back up. Come on now. Black oppression in America. More is involved here than That's a what this parallel is about. between blacks and southern whites. What is involved is a common subculture that goes back for centuries, which has encompassed everything from ways of talking to attitudes toward education, violence, and sex and which originated not in the South, but in those parts of the British Isles from which white Southerners came. That culture long ago died out where it originated in Britain while surviving in the American South. Then it largely died out among both white and black Southerners while still surviving today in the poorest and worst of the urban black ghettos. It is not uncommon for a culture to survive longer where it is transplanted and to retain characteristics lost in its place of origin. The French spoken in Quebec and the Spanish spoken in Mexico contain words and phrases that have long since become archaic in France and Spain. Regional German dialects persisted among Germans living in the United States after those dialects had begun to die out in Germany itself. A scholar specializing in the history of the South has likewise noted among white Southerners archaic word forms, while another scholar has pointed out the continued use in that region of terms that were familiar at the time of the first Queen Elizabeth. The card game whist is today played almost exclusively by blacks, especially low-income blacks, though in the 18th century it was played by the British upper classes and has since then evolved into bridge. The history of the evolution of this game is indicative of a much broader pattern of cultural evolution in much more weighty things. Southern whites not only spoke the English language in very different ways from whites in other regions, their churches, their roads, their homes, their music, their education, their food, and their sex lives were all sharply different from those of other whites. Culture. The history of this redneck or cracker culture is more than a curiosity. It has contemporary significance because of its influence on the economic and social evolution of vast numbers of people, millions of blacks and whites, and its continuing influence on the lives and deaths of a residual population in America's black ghettos, which has still not completely escaped from that culture. From early in American history, foreign visitors and domestic travelers alike were struck by cultural contrasts between the white population of the South and that of the rest of the country in general, and of New England in particular. In the early 19th century, Alexis de Tocqueville, 
contrasted white Southerners with white Northerners in his classic Democracy in America. And Frederick Law Olmsted did the same later in his books about his travels through the antebellum South, notably Cotton Kingdom. Hmm. De Tocqueville set a pattern when he concluded that almost all the differences which may be noticed between the Americans in the Southern and in the Northern states have originated in slavery. Olmsted likewise attributed the differences between white Southerners and white Northerners to the existence of slavery in the South. So did widely read antebellum Southern writer Hinton Helper, who declared that slavery, and nothing but slavery, has retarded the progress and prosperity of our portion of the Union. That's what liberals think. Just as they explained regional differences between whites by slavery, so many others in a later era would explain differences between blacks and whites nationwide by slavery. Blamed it on slavery. Plausible as these explanations may seem in both cases, they will not stand up under a closer scrutiny of history. It is perhaps understandable that the great overwhelming moral curse of slavery has presented a tempting causal explanation of the peculiar subculture of Southern whites, mm -hmm. as well as that of blacks. Yet this same subculture had existed among Southern whites and their ancestors in those parts of the British Isles from which they came, <laughs> long before they had ever seen a black slave. Mm -hmm. The nature of this subculture, among people who came were called Britain. rednecks and crackers in Britain before they ever saw America, needs to be explored before turning to the question of its current status among ghetto blacks and how developments in the larger society have affected its evolution. Emigration from Britain, like other migrations around the world, was not random in either its origins or its destinations. Most of the Britons who migrated to colonial Massachusetts, for example, came from within a 60-mile radius of the town of Haverhill in East Anglia. The Virginia aristocracy came from different localities in southern and western England. Most of the common white people of the South came from the northern borderlands of England. Are catching For it? centuries, a no man's land between Scotland and England, as well as from the Scottish Highlands and from Ulster County, Ireland. All these fringe areas were turbulent, if not lawless, regions, where none of the contending forces was able to establish full control and create a stable order. Whether called a Celtic fringe or North Britons, these were people from outside the cultural heartland of England, as they were on both sides of the Atlantic. Not shore. race, y'all. Before the era of modern transportation and communication, sharp regional differences were both common and persistent. Highlanders, In some of the counties of colonial Virginia, lowlanders. from nearly three quarters to four fifths of the people came from Northern Britain, and similar proportions were found in some of the counties of Kentucky and Tennessee as well as in parts of both the Carolinas. Although they predominated in many parts of the South, such people also had some northern enclaves in colonial America, notably western Pennsylvania, where Ulster Scott settled. <laughs> what is at least equally important as where Mountains. particular people settled is when they emigrated from the borderlands, Ulster, and the Scottish Highlands. Scotland in particular progressed enormously in the 18th century. The level from which it began may be indicated by the fact that a visitor to late 18th century Edinburgh found it noteworthy that its residents no longer threw sewage from their chamber pots out their windows into the street, <laughs> something that passers-by had long had to be alert for to mm. avoid being splattered. Ew. Such crude and unsanitary living had long been characteristic of earlier times when rural Scots lived in Nigga the same shit. shelters with their animals. Nigga shit. Abounded. But they white. A similar lack of concern with cleanliness was found among others in the borderlands of Britain and among their descendants on the other side of the Atlantic mm -hmm. in the antebellum South. For example, a 19th century politician built up a political machine in the poor white districts of Mississippi by such practices as this. He did not resort to any conventional tactics of kissing dirty babies, but he pleased mothers and fathers in log cabins by taking their children upon his lap and searching for red bugs, lice, and other vermin. Back in the British Isles, mm. the life of the Scottish people was transformed dramatically from the masses to the elites as they advanced from being one of the least educated to one of the most educated peoples in Europe. However, what is significant they chose to is change. that much of the migration to the American South occurred before these sweeping social transformations. This timing was crucial. As Professor Grady McWhiney has pointed out in his book, Cracker Culture. Had the South been peopled by 19th century Scots, Welshmen, and Ulstermen, the course of Southern history would doubtless have been radically different. 
19th century Scottish and Scotch-Irish immigrants did in fact fit quite comfortably into Northern American society. Significantly, the Irish, who retained their Celtic ways, did not. But only a trickle of the flood of 19th century immigrants came into the South. The ancestors of the vast majority of Southerners arrived in America before the Anglicization of Scotland, mm. Wales, and Ulster had advanced very far. In earlier centuries, Scotland was a poor and backward country, like Wales and Ireland, and like the turbulent northern borderlands of England, where the Scots and the English fought wars and committed atrocities against each other for centuries. White people. Local feuding clans and freebooting marauders kept this region in an uproar. Race. Even when there were no military hostilities new, between the English and Scottish kingdoms. It's a political tool. Ulster County had a different kind of turbulence, as the English and Scottish settlers there encountered the hostility and terrorist activities of the Congress, dispossessed, people. and embittered indigenous Irish population. White people. These were the parts of Britain from which most people migrated if to you the believe American in South. Race. Before the political and cultural unification of the British Isles, or the standardization of the English language, the rednecks of these regions were what one social historian has called some of the most disorderly inhabitants of a deeply disordered land. The rednecks of these regions. I'm not gonna play like that. I wasn't taken in by the whole race card thing as well, man. What's so crazy about it? is I consider myself intelligent, right? Like, we all think we not a part of it. We all read the story like we not in the book, like we sitting back. And that that's what the cheat code is really about. <clears throat> not actually being in a story. And it takes some doing other than you just imagine and you not in the story. Let me put that in real time because most people that play ball all their life, pretty much, you might take breaks when you're younger, right? Go back athletically, you can pick it right back up. That mind state never leave a man, right? Until he get out there in the court and and realize you can't just think. You know what I'm saying? There's no just thinking it. Something's got to be done. You don't retain shit without. So <clears throat> this whole thing about race, like I worked in Columbia, Maryland for shit a while. And Columbia, Maryland was set up with the grift in mind or grooming, even though it was grooming. It, it was it can go what they tried to do with racial harmony. It was a good idea, but it was a bad idea because it's no such thing as race. It's what we listen to now, culture. And they created these lines. Once you do that, that's it. Like the black and white lines are not good for anybody. Um, I can do my part to break the lines down because I did my part to build the lines up. I worked in Columbia, Maryland for a while and that's black and white harmony. That's what it was built for. Shout out to the Rouse Company. And I worked with people and they were what you would consider white, right? Like what I thought them was white. Now I know just American with descendancies from different nations. I never saw these mean white people that was on TV. And I mean, I worked around white people that was where I was at. My whole life was around so-called white people. But these racist-ass white people that I heard about all the time, they never manifested. But I, I was convinced that they existed. But in reality, I had never experienced it. What I had experienced was word of mouth gossip, things being passed down that I couldn't validate. Um, Leviticus 19 and 16 speaks against that. And that's a fear when people got to jump the gun on on something so they don't fall victim to it but the word of the creator the that'll hold you like and that's another thing that you have to learn too you don't have to be afraid but people take word of mouth trying to be the first one to do this the first one to do that to the point where they put out fraudulent information and people will go along with it just so they won't seem like they're actually the one that's a fraud and not down and people never investigate they never look into stuff they never take the unpopular point of view because everybody want to be popular. You know what I'm saying? One thing you should understand about the truth is it's not popular and people won't like the taste that it leaves in, the, in their mouth. But um, that's what's so perfect about this for me because thinking that I might not be here anymore, I don't really give two fucks about offending people, especially offending them in a manner of the stuff that I'm saying. If you offended by this, then good for you. You know, you were part of the lie. And 
you're not reading about somebody else in the book. You're reading about yourself. The cheat code is about taking yourself out the book. When I say these boundaries of man, be it their licenses, agreement, any of it, their monuments, the way they interpret the word of God with man in mind is just beyond me how a people of God could go along with it unless you are a part of it. You can see out of your understanding. Well, I can see how. No, it's not for you to see how. It's, it's just to be obedient militant mind state everybody's talking about they're a soldier of god and don't even know what the war is they're supposed to be fighting illiteracy is one of those things this right here information that's supposed to be passed down from one generation to the next it get hijacked with greed with idolatry traditional shit that's just not there when when you challenge it, and I'm I'm going to challenge, you know, if y'all have a problem with, with a challenge, it's probably because you support the lie. So let's get back to this truth, y'all. Or what one social historian has called some of the most disorderly inhabitants of a deeply disordered land. Not white blacks. In this world of white laws, daily dangers and lives that could be snuffed out at any moment, the snatching at whatever fleeting pleasures presented themselves Ridden. was at least understandable. Certainly prudence and long-range planning of one's life had no such payoff in this chaotic world as in more settled and orderly societies under the protection of effective laws. <laughs> Books, businesses, technology, and science were not the kinds of things likely to be promoted or admired in the world of the rednecks and crackers. Manliness and the forceful projection of that manliness to others and advertising of one's willingness to fight and even to put one's life on the line, Nigga shit. were at least plausible means of gaining whatever measure of security was possible Same in shit. a lawless region and a violent time. The kinds of attitudes and cultural values produced by centuries of living under such conditions did not disappear very quickly, even when social evolution in North America slowly and almost imperceptibly created a new and different world with different objective prospects. Maryland homeowners, if you're tired of paying too much money Add bucks, shout out to the Hoover Institute okay. channel, Thomas Soul TV, for the information that we're listening to right now, shout out to y'all. What the rednecks or crackers brought with them across the ocean was a whole constellation of attitudes, values, and behavior patterns that might have made sense in the world in which they had lived for centuries, but which would prove to be counterproductive in the world to which they were going. Limited. Your behavior is limited. Not because you black, because it's not a desirable behavior for certain situations and has nothing to do with discrimination, more so taste or to the liking. But another group used that. They weaponized that to put fear in people that's ignorant, such as myself, took the whole thing about racing because I didn't take the thing in about God. If, if you stand the creator... If you stand under creation, it's hard to stand under man. Well, man and woman is the only thing we can we can stand under. And let me let me correct myself. If we men and women, then we can't be black. We can't be white. What you can be is from a region. What you can be is from a culture. Um, in times past, you was just Greek, Roman, or whatever. It didn't matter whether your skin was anything. Didn't didn't matter. It was what you believe. Uh, bloodlines didn't even matter because people were killing inside their bloodlines for different rules, nephews, cousins. Um, it was more more about a behavior than anything else, you know. So it's always been a behavior and not a skin tone. They have pushed that here in the United States of America to make things political so they can cater to a specific group. And generally it's going to be the blacks because... It's easiest to do it to you, you know, and it's so easy because emotion is the basis of all your logic. I say I'm not black. I understand exactly what I'm saying. The people that call themselves black see it as a diss, a slap in the face. And instead of letting me be about my way and just saying, fuck them, don't play with this ball. No, they're going to force me oppressively to be black by shame or or muscle, like, oh, you black just like the rest of us. Oh, fuck them up, oh, something like that. It's not, oh, you got a right to be who you are, per Allah. No, you, you guys just drafted me into being black. When I was ignorant, yeah, I was that, but I'm not. I know better, and I tell everybody who they are, and they think it's a me thing. I'm like, nah, you, 
you openly accept the state telling you or you signing in with the state because of tradition, because of your parents, because of what what their limits were. So most people see me or they cap me where their cap is. And I can understand that if it was just talk, but y'all that's been here, you know I'm more than just talk, you know, pretty much behind the camera as, as I'm talking about it. You know, people say show, improve, it changed. Now it's just talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and make somebody else prove to you while you haven't proven shit. You just disagree with the person. Um, I'm not interested in that. And that, that got old fast. I don't even understand. Like, shout out to Sign at a TV. Um, years and years doing that, that, that thing, the back and forth thing. Like, and his numbers are like, I looked at this, this guy he used to get up there with the views, live streams. Now he like under, under double digit viewers and he got well, I think triple digit followers. I haven't even seen what his subscription is now, but it's ran its course and it's ran its course because it's a lot of words. It's like sitcoms. The ages, the people gonna grow, it's gonna age out. And if it's not fruit, it ages out a lot quicker. So it's done. It's like anything could be a comet. You know, the sun is there forever. The sun will forever shine. Comets just streak. You know, stars or, or what, like this big, you don't, it's nothing intimate about it, but the sun, it's the truth. That's the true light. You know what I'm saying? We know that sun worldwide. Everybody don't know the sun. Everybody don't know the moon. Some places can't see that, but you know the daytime come because of what? You dig it? Hold on, y'all. Let me get back to this. And counterproductive to the blacks who would live in their midst for centuries, productive in the world to which they were going. Rednecks. And counterproductive to the blacks who would live in their midst for centuries before emerging into freedom and migrating to the great urban centers of the United States, taking with them similar values. The cultural values and social patterns prevalent among Southern whites included an aversion to work, proneness to violence, neglect of education, sexual promiscuity, improvidence, drunkenness, Lack of entrepreneurship. Shout out to Mr. Mosby. Reckless searches for excitement. Fly lively music and Mr. dance. Robert. And a style of religious Uncle oratory Cooper. marked by Aunt strident Mary. rhetoric, unbridled emotions, and flamboyant imagery. All drunks, I mean. This oratorical style carried over into the political oratory of the region in both the Jim Crow era and the Civil Rights era. Job. And has continued on into our own times among black politicians, preachers, and activists. Touchy pride, vanity, and boastful self-dramatization were also part of this redneck culture among people from regions of Britain where the civilization was the least developed. They boast and lack self-restraint, Olmsted said, after observing their descendants in the American antebellum South. While Professor Grady McWhiney's cracker culture is perhaps the most thorough historical study of the values and behavioral patterns of white Southerners, Many other scholarly studies have turned up very similar patterns, even when they differed in some ways as to the causes. Professor David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed, for example, challenges the Celtic connection thesis put forth by Professor McWhiney, but shows many of the same cultural patterns among the same people, both in Britain and in the American South. Popular writings of the 19th and 20th centuries have likewise described similar behavior including the Indianapolis residents' comments on white Southern migrants to that city, which sounds so much like what many have said about ghetto blacks. None of this is meant to claim that these patterns have remained rigidly unchanged over the centuries, or that there are literally no differences between whites and blacks in any aspects of this subculture. However, what is remarkable is how pervasive and how close the similarities have been. Mm -hmm. Centuries before black pride became a fashionable phrase, there was cracker pride, and it was very much the same kind of pride. And it still is. It was not pride in any particular achievement or set of behavioral standards or moral principles adhered mm -hmm. to. It was instead a touchiness about anything that might be even remotely construed as a personal slight, much less an insult, combined with a willingness to erupt into violence over it. New Englanders were baffled about this kind of pride among crackers 
Nigga observing shit. such people. The Yankees could not understand what they had to feel proud about. <laughs> However, this kind of pride is perhaps best illustrated by an episode recorded in Professor original Cracker Culture. When an Englishman, tired of waiting for a southerner to start working on a house he had contracted to build, hired another man to do the job, the enraged southerner, who considered himself dishonored, vowed, Tomorrow morn, I will come with men and twenty rifles, and I will have your life, or you shall have mine. In the Keeping vernacular of our later times, he had been dissed, and he was not going to stand for it, regardless of the consequences for himself or others. The history of the antebellum South is full of episodes showing the same pattern whether expressed in the highly formalized duels of the aristocracy or in the no-holds-barred style of fighting called rough and tumble among the common folk, a style that included biting off ears and gouging out eyes. Mm. It was not simply that particular isolated individuals mm. did such things. Social approval was given to these practices, as illustrated by this episode in the Antebellum South. Mm. A crowd gathered and arranged itself in an impromptu ring the contestants were asked if they wished to fight fair or rough and tumble. When they chose rough and tumble, a roar of approval rose from the multitude. Nigga shit. This particular fight ended with the loser's nose bitten off, his ears torn off, and both his eyes gouged out. After which, the victor himself, maimed and bleeding, was chaired round the grounds Nigga to shit. the cheers of the crowd. He kept it real. This rough and tumble style of fighting was also popular in the southern highlands of Scotland, where grabbing an opponent's testicles highlands. and attempting to castrate him by hand was also not an just, accepted practice. Not just Scotland, the highlands. Scottish highlanders were, in centuries past, part of the Celtic fringe, or North Britons, outside the orbit of English culture, not only as it existed in England, but also in the Scottish lowlands. The Highlanders lagged far behind the Lowlanders in education and economic progress, Culture. as well as in the speaking of the English language. Culture. For Gaelic was still widely spoken by Highlanders in the 19th century, not only in Scotland itself, but also in North Carolina and in Australia, where immigrants from the Scottish Highlands were unable to communicate with English-speaking people, including Lowland Scots, who had also immigrated. In the Hebrides Islands off Scotland, Gaelic had still not completely died out in the middle of the 20th century. What is important Native in the crime and violence patterns among rednecks and crackers was not that particular people did particular things at particular times and places, nor is it necessary to attempt to quantify such behavior. What is crucial is that violence growing out of such pride had social approval. As Professor McWhiney pointed out, men often killed and went free in the South, just as in earlier times they had in Ireland and Scotland. As one observer in the South noted, enemies would meet, exchange insults, and one would shoot the other down, <laughs> professing that he had acted in self-defense because shit. he believed the victim was armed. When such a story was Man, told in court, early police. in a community where it is not a strange thing for men to carry about their person's deadly weapons, each member of the jury like feels this. that he would have done the same thing under similar circumstances, Real shit. so that in condemning him, they would but condemn themselves. Judge not lest ye the be actions judged. of southern courts often amazed outsiders, Professor McWhiney said. Law. But what may be even more revealing of widespread <laughs> attitudes were the cases that never even went to trial. As another study of white southerners put it, to many rural southerners, rather than a set of legal statutes, justice remained a matter of societal norms allowing for... Look, y'all, see, this is what I'm saying, the extremes with stuff, because... They had it right to a certain degree. You know, sometimes it takes a certain degree of ignorance or barbarianism to straighten shit out. So why they had it right with, uh, look, I'm going to get judged by this same pattern. Like, what would you do? Would you just allow this to happen? And any man, recently this old man, um, I believe his name was Jose Alba in... NYC or Philadelphia stabbed a man of death that came in a bodega and started beating up on him because uh, that man's girlfriend came in there with their daughter a little early and her EBT card got declined, right? And so her story was the old man snatched the bag out of her little girl's hand. So she called her boyfriend named Simon, such and such or whatever. 
and Simon came in in this video of Simon like pushing old man down into like a rack of potato chips and the old man stayed there just sitting there for a minute and then he tried to get up and the guy grabbed him around the neck and the next thing you know you see blood on that guy's hand that grabbed the old man around the neck they had a knife in the bodega and he stabbed that guy like five times he hit him hit him in the neck and they arrested this old man and charged him with um murder you know what i'm saying they charged him with with murder it since then they released him and charged him with second degree something but to be charged at all y'all you understand what i'm saying to defend yourself and that's that's the the political part we got to make it look good like they really in control and we don't need that like that's that's the bullshit that the north and south uh beefed about that kind of shit and the slavery the the north used that as a political theme as well they didn't give a shit about slaves in, in all actuality they was trying to get public opinion on their side so lincoln lincoln did whatever the fuck he needed to do politically some joe biden shit but they pushed lincoln as the emancipator of blacks and he loved you niggas and all that shit and you buy it because it's it's um it's palatable and it don't cost them nothing it costs you everything you know what i'm saying the indigenous people who claim that they from africa and if i put you to the test it'll be a bunch of lies that your grandma or somebody else lied about and it's a shame like what people do to feel to feel any 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 more special than the creator made us to be that's the thing about being more than man and woman you take your value and oh i got a chick from the barbados i got a, a i hear this stuff i heard it in songs yesterday and that's the value system i got a sweet little mommy from such and such and such well i got a wife i got a munch from right here uh next to where i live at and i put her up against any of these you got them from anywhere you know we 30 years in i know your your music video is nice and you got a mommy and I don't, I don't remember seeing any of those dudes on those videos married to any of those mommies in those videos. None of that stuff. Years later, the videos that we used to watch, I don't see none of you dudes with those chicks that y'all had in them, right? So my, I was, I was with the same woman while y'all was popping and bubbling the cars. And I'm still, you know, like maintaining, doing decent. I, I didn't take a step backwards. I had what I needed the whole time, and um, y'all don't have the same stuff. You know what I'm saying? People, why, life wasn't just that moment. Like, y'all, you dig it? They talk about it being a marathon and, and talking slick and rap verses, but in actuality, it, it is that. And people get caught up, and it's, it used to be my day. I'm like, well, it still can't be my day. I'm alive now. Anyway, y'all, let me put this back on. I'm playing the shit out this game, trying not to get out. I'm, I'm move. Ah, oh, damn, there it is. All right, my bad. I'm sorry, folks. I'm in here making a video. We 33 minutes in. I'm ahead of time too, cause I wanted it to be about an hour. Hopefully, um, from this, y'all can branch out and find out more information. Shit, drop some information for me. But if you don't like it, um, that's cool too. That's natural. It's human nature not to agree with everybody, but what I learned with Torah is fuck you when I don't like you, you know what I'm saying? And I don't have to say it to your face because it ain't really going to change anything in your life. But I know, again, shout out to Sign Out of TV, shout out to this debate league, that debate league, shout out to all the brothers that ever participated under the umbrella of consciousness, under the umbrella of religion and spirituality. Shout out to all of y'all because it's through y'all that I see my growth. I checked in on all y'all channels and y'all right at the same place, still fighting and beefing with each other. Y'all claiming a law here, y'all claiming your who should, whoever there, and, and y'all don't get it. Like y'all character ain't, ain't of any of it. Whatever y'all pretending that y'all are, it's not. Y'all can't separate yourselves from that. It's something that's pulling y'all. Y'all spirits ain't right. You control by something. Y'all, y'all exist in trying to conquer some shit that won't change anything. Who got the last word? And this guy's gay. All that time, men, men, men invested in having words of war. No ground, no resources. 
reading this book, professing to be this guy, that guy. I'm like, y'all don't get it. Whole time have state-based IDs. They got a real war in their hand. You know, they subjects to Christianity. They don't care who, what you talking about. Your whole way of living is under Christian rule, the colonization of this place, right? You hear these people fighting this way and that way, like the Irish, not, not just the Irish against the Scots, the Scots against the Scots, the Highlanders against the Lowlanders. You get here and just think, and you're 50 or 60, whatever years of existence, that is racism. Racism came with the United States of America, and it didn't come with the discovery of America. It came with the United States of America, the corporation where now we need people in office. So this is how we get there. Politicize it. Use it this way. Abraham Lincoln understood it. That's the significance of Lincoln. The person that you should be leery of, that's the one you're cheering for. This has always been the case. If you start up at top and not at the foundation of what's what, this is a part of it, y'all. Professor McWhiney said. But what may be even more revealing of widespread attitudes were the cases that never even went to trial. As another study of white Street Southerners put it, to I'm many with rural it. Southerners, rather than a set of legal statutes, justice remained a matter of societal norms allowing for respect of property rights, individual honor, and a maximum of personal independence. They got it right. Any that violation part. of this pattern amounted to a breach of justice requiring a specific response from the injured party. This is right. Upon learning that a youthful neighbor had approached his wife in an overly friendly manner, Robert Leard of Tangipahoa, Louisiana, promptly tracked the young man down and killed him. No problem with it. Woods code of justice, Even if it was my son. less would have invited shame and ridicule upon the Leard family. He would understand. He had a white man. personal pride was connected by Olmstead with the fiend-like street fights of the South. He mentioned an episode of public murder with impunity. A gentleman of veracity, now living in the South, told me that among his friends, he had once numbered two young men who were themselves intimate friends. To one of them, taking offense at some foolish words uttered by the other, challenges him. A large crowd assembled to see the duel, which took place on a piece of prairie ground. The combatants came armed with rifles, and at the first interchange of Make shots, shit. the challenged man fell disabled by a ball in the thigh. The other, throwing down his rifle, Drop walked head. toward him, and kneeling by his side, drew a bowie knife and deliberately butchered him. The crowd of bystanders not only permitted this, but the execrable assassin still lives in the community, has since married, and, as far as my informant could judge, his social position has been rather sure. advanced than otherwise <laughs> from thus shit. dealing with his enemy. Again, what is important here is not the isolated incident itself, but the set of social attitudes which allowed such incidents to take place publicly with impunity. The killer knowing in advance that what he was doing had community approval. Moreover, such attitudes went back for centuries on both sides of the Atlantic, at least among the particular people concerned. It's not a black behavior. During the era when dueling became a pattern among upper-class Americans, between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, it was particularly prevalent in the South. As a social history of the United States noted, of Southern statesmen who rose to prominence after 1790, hardly one can be mentioned who was not involved in a duel. Editors of Southern <laughs> newspapers niggas. became involved in duels so often that cartoonists depicted them with a pen in one hand and a dueling pistol in the other. Most duels arose not over substantive issues, but over words considered insulting. At lower social levels, Southern feuds such as that between the Hatfields and the McCoys, which began in a dispute over a pig and ultimately claimed more than 20 lives, became legendary. It has been estimated that Those are white at least three are. quarters of the settlers in colonial New England originated in the lowland southeastern half of Britain. A similarly large proportion of the population of the South originated in the Scottish Highlands, Ireland, Wales, or the northern and western uplands. White on white. Those arriving from Ireland in colonial times would have been from Ulster County, where Scots and Englishmen settled, since substantial immigration of the indigenous Irish did not begin until near the middle of the 19th century. 
radically different cultures could develop and persist during this era Culture, before transportation bro. and communication developed I got to it. the point of promoting widespread Tell interactions among people in different regions. It's culture. In colonial America, the people of the English borderlands and of the Celtic fringe were seen by contemporaries as culturally quite distinct and were socially unwelcome. Mob action prevented a shipload of Ulster Scots from landing in Boston in 1719 and the Quaker leaders of Eastern Pennsylvania encouraged Ulster Scots to settle out in Western Pennsylvania, where they acted as a buffer to the Indians, as well as being a constant source of friction and conflict with the Indians. Culture. It was not just in the North that crackers and rednecks were considered to be undesirables. Southern plantation owners with poor whites living on adjoining land would often offer to buy their land for more than it was worth in order to be rid of such neighbors. Because there were no racial differences Racism. to form separate statistical categories for these North Britons and for other whites who settled in the South, or in particular enclaves elsewhere, indirect indicators must serve as proxies for these cultural differences. Names are among these indicators. Edward, for example, was a popular name in Virginia and in Wessex, England, from which many Virginians had emigrated. But the first 40 classes of undergraduates at Harvard College contained only one man named Edward. It would be nearly two centuries before Harvard enrolled anyone named Patrick, even though that was a common name in western Pennsylvania where the Ulster Scots settled. Y'all getting it? This says something not only about the social and geographic differences of the times, but also about how regionalized the naming patterns were then, in contrast to the fact that no one today finds it particularly strange when an Asian American has such non-Asian first names as Kevin or Michelle. Even where there was no conflict or hostility involved, Southerners often showed a reckless disregard for human life, including their own. For example, the racing of steamboats that happened to encounter each other on the rivers of the South often ended with exploding boilers, especially when the excited competition led to the tying down of safety valves in order to build up more pressure to generate more speed. An impromptu race between steamboats that encountered each other on the Mississippi illustrates the pattern 12 o'clock boys on board one boat motorcycle was an old wheel. Lady who having bought a winter stock of bacon pork etc was returning to her home on the banks of the mississippi fun lovers on board both boats insisted upon a race cheers and drawn pistols obliged the captains to cooperate as the boats struggled to outdistance each other excited passengers demanded more speed despite every effort the boats raced evenly until the old lady directed her slaves to throw all her casks of bacon into the boilers. Her boat then moved ahead of the other vessel, which suddenly exploded. Clouds of splinters and human limbs darkened the sky. On the undamaged boat, passengers shouted their victory, but above their cheers could be heard the shrill voice of the old lady crying, I did it, I did it, it's all my bacon. On the Mississippi, and other western rivers of the United States as it existed in the early so 19th bacon, century. Yo. It has been estimated that 30% of all the steamboats were cut. lost in accidents. Part of this may have been due to deficiencies in the early steamboats themselves, but much of it was due to the recklessness with which they were operated on southern rivers. The comments of a fireman on a Mississippi steamboat of that era may suggest why a river voyage was considered more dangerous than crossing the Atlantic. Nigga at a shit. time when sinkings in the Atlantic were by no means rare. Talk about northern steamers, the fireman of a Mississippi steamboat sneered to an eastern traveler Nigga in 1844. Shit. It don't need no spunk to navigate them waters. You ain't bust a biler in five years. But I tell you, stranger, it takes a man to ride one of these half alligator boats head on a snag, high pressures, valve soldered down, 600 souls on board, and in danger going to... Y'all know what it is. Add box again, y'all. Add box again. Uh, there we go. This was no mere idle talk. Among the steamboat explosions in the South, one on the Mississippi in 1838 killed well over a hundred people, and another near Baton Rouge in 1859 killed more than half. Do the research. Hundred people on board. Pull it up and yourself. Injured more than half the survivors. Southerners were just as reckless on land, 
whether in escapades undertaken for the excitement of the moment or in the many fights and deaths resulting from some insult or slight it's history yo touchy about their honor and how you use it though again all of this went back to a way of life in the turbulent regions of britain from which white southerners came nor is it hard to recognize in these actions. So listen, in history, it's just going to show um, uh, a steamboat blowing up, steamboat blowing up. But the pattern of behavior with who these people were that was happening to us all a part of it. And I, I can't give people my perspective, but it's bigger than than y'all just knowing history. It's why it is these people that settle with each other, like, dig into it. It's lazy to just say it's race. It's not fair to your kids. It's a, it's a cop-out. You just took it. Like, historically, blacks say they don't trust their government. Who do you think installed your, your educational system? Your historical black colleges. Anybody that graduated from a historical black college... Um, I don't know how I feel about you for one, the pre pretense is that you're really intelligent because the college degree, but the college that you at was established by the opposite of what you're talking about. Like I can name four colleges off the top that was established by the white people or the system or the systemic races, Howard, Hampton, Spellman, Morgan, all founded by the so-called white man. And then you get in white colleges and you pledge Greek, right? I don't care because Greek is a nation and there's people there that could probably be black, but that's not the the image that y'all trying to give. So you're confused and, and proud to be confused or bougie saying you're not a part of this. That's oppressive. You know, you oppressive because you don't feel like that really. So you acting it out. What I did realize in all these years, all 54, almost 55 of them, that white people don't do white shit. They don't. Like, we hearing it now. They they do what they want. It's not compared to anybody. Like, the northern whites, the southern whites, they didn't behave white. They didn't. <laughs> I don't know what they behave. You hear two distinct behaviors. One of us behaving like niggas, some real nigga shit. The culture that blacks adore whites hated it like other this always been that and you think that it's about your skin they push this about your skin oh they don't like you because of your skin vote for us we like your skin it's been there everything that's going on today is with that in mind from the homosexuals to the jews it's political because y'all take feelings about stuff that don't hurt that don't manifest like if all your shit about Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Nat Turner, all these black heroes was false, what would change right now today? Or even more so by studying those people, how have you been able to emancipate yourself from a, a systemic or racist system? You have, and it's just a picture on your wall. Idolatry, something to worship. Most people think that. The scripts don't work or the Bible is corrupted. And I agree. If you don't know how to use a gun, it's worthless to you. So I know how to use this book. And I think I've shown people like this government, this oh so oppressive. I pushed it right off me. Like, and I show people constantly. But what people don't really want the truth, I come to that too. Like it's when people that I don't like that didn't want the truth as well as people that I love. And still love. They just don't want the truth. They want their way. I see it more and more in all these experiences that I have with people I'm thankful for. Even the people that's no longer in my life. The ones that are still here. Um, the ones that won't be here. Maybe the ones that are coming. Like I'm thankful for it because it gives me a true, a true look at everybody. You know, starting with my mom. I was like, if I hold 100% 10 toes down to the word of the creator... It'll show everything, you know, and it does. It's people that's looking for breaks. It's people that's looking for exceptions. Everybody want an exception and they don't want to give you shit. They, they want your rights to be their exception, not something that they deserve. It's just something that they want because that's how they feel. They want this whole story about blacks and the oppression to be real because they need it. For what? I don't know why. You've been saying it forever. 
And it's been a lie forever. It's never manifested itself into anything. All the documentation is here, just like I'm playing this out. But blacks aren't interested in this. They are interested in being a victim so you can have some other black day to cheer for. Give your kids that. Make them feel good that you had a party. This book say don't have any parties or feast days. That's teaching self-reliance. Y'all don't even get that part. No, I'm going to have a birthday. That way I really feel special. Take a day that man named to make you feel special. You, you just don't. You can't possibly manifest some happiness yourself. You can't be fruitful and produce that. Got you, Jack. You so divine. Clear parallels to the behavior and attitudes of ghetto gangs today hmm. who kill over a look or a word hmm. or any action that can be construed as dissing them. Hmm. Pride had yet another side to it. Among the definitions of a cracker in the Oxford Dictionary is a braggart, one who talks trash in today's vernacular. A wisecracker. More than mere wisecracks were involved, however. The pattern is one said by Professor McWhiney to go back to description of ancient Celts as boasters and threateners and given to bombastic self-dramatization. Examples today come readily to mind, not only from ghetto life and gangster rap, but also from militant black leaders, spokesmen, or activists. What is painfully ironic is that such attitudes and behavior are projected today as aspects of a distinctive black identity, when in fact, they are part of a centuries-old pattern among the whites in whose midst generations of blacks lived in the South. Mm. Any broad brush discussion of cultural patterns must, of course, not claim that all people, whether white or black, had the same culture much less to the same degree. Y'all know what it is. There are not only changes over time, there are cross currents at any given time. Nevertheless, it is useful to see the outlines of a general pattern, even when that pattern erodes over time and at varying rates among different subgroups. Mm -hmm. The violence for which white Southerners became most lastingly notorious was lynching. Like other aspects of the redneck and cracker culture, it has often been attributed to race or slavery. In fact, however, most lynching victims in the antebellum South were white. Economic considerations alone would prevent a slave owner from lynching his own slave or tolerating anyone else's doing so. It was only after the Civil War that the emancipated blacks became the principal targets of lynching. But by then, Southern vigilante violence had been a tradition for more than a century in North America. And even longer back in the regions of Britain, it wasn't just against black sure. where retributive justice was often left in private hands. Even the burning cross of the Ku Klux Klan has been traced back to the fiery cross of old Scotland used by feuding clans. <whistles> Observers of the white population of the antebellum South often commented not only on their poverty, but also on their lack of industriousness or entrepreneurship. A contemporary characterized many white Southerners as too poor to keep slaves and too proud to work. A landmark history of agriculture in the antebellum South Niggas. described the poor whites this way. They cultivated in a casual and careless fashion small patches of corn or rice, sweet potatoes, cow peas, and garden products. Women and children did a large part of the work. The men spent their time principally in hunting or idleness. The men were inveterate drunkards, and sometimes the women joined them in drinking inferior whiskey. Licentiousness was prevalent among them. Among their equals, the men were quarrelsome and inclined to crimes of violence. The poor whites were densely ignorant. Their labors tended to be intermittent, often when they were pressed for money, rather than a steady employment career. Frederick Law Olmsted called it lazy poverty with whatever work they did being done in a thoughtless manner. Summarizing his observations in the antebellum South, Olmsted said, I know that while men seldom want an abundance of coarse food in the cotton states, the proportion of the free white men who live as well in any aspect as our working classes in the North, on an average, is small, and that the citizens of the cotton states, as a whole, are poor. They work little, and that little, badly. They earn little, they sell little, they buy little, and they have little, very little, of the common comforts and consolations of civilized life. 
Their destitution is not material only, it is intellectual and it is moral. Quality and craftsmanship. Here we go, y'all. Add box again. When Olmsted found work done efficiently, promptly, and well during his travels through the South, when he found well-run businesses, good libraries, impressive churches, and efficiently functioning institutions in general, he almost invariably found them to be run by Northerners, foreigners, or Jews. Nor was he the only visiting observer to reach such conclusions. Another observed that nearly all of the Old South's successful storekeepers were either Yankees or Yankee-trained Southerners. In your communities. That when you saw a plantation in better condition than others, you would often discover that it was owned by someone from the North. A history of Southern agriculture presented this picture of North Carolina in the early 18th century. It's like black owned businesses. Many of the inhabitants were rough borderers who lived a crude, half savage existence. Some were herdsmen, dependent mainly on the product of the range and under the necessity of eating meat without bread. There were also many thriftless and lazy families who had been attracted to the country by the mild climate so. and the ease with which a bare livelihood could be obtained by hunting and fishing, raising a little corn and keeping a few head of swine and possibly a cow or two on the range. On the other hand, there were small farmers, many of northern or European extraction, living industrious and thrifty lives amidst a rude abundance and considerable diversity of food supplies. They maintained good-sized herds of cattle, swine, and sheep, and the women made butter and cheese. Mm. Borderers, at that point, would refer to people minutes. from the borderlands of Britain, those included in what Professor McWhiney and others have called the Celtic Fringe, and what Professor Fisher called North Britons. While the making of butter and cheese might seem to be an unremarkable activity in most rural communities, butter and cheese making by these farmers of non-southerner origins was in fact exceptional in the South. One of Frederick Law Olmsted's complaints during his travels through the antebellum South was the scarcity of butter, despite all the cows he saw. Even among plantation owners, he said, as for butter, some have heard of it, some have seen it, but few have eaten it. Hard data support his conclusions about the scarcity of butter in the antebellum South, despite an abundance of cows. In 1860, the South had 40% of all the dairy cows in the country, but produced just 20% of the butter and only 1% of the cheese. Let me let me go something someplace else right now to um, give y'all a little comparison. And of course, y'all know I'm going to the brother. Uh-oh, I think I got an issue here, y'all. We're moving kind of slow. Let me put the charge in. The phone is acting like it want to die. Okay. All right. I brought it back to life. I want to check in with um, another elder to put this on point, to put this in proper perspective. This is the elder Malcolm, and this is following up with all the cows that these rednecks actually own. They have 40% of that. Where they were yet, they were destitute. Look at this. White immigrants can come to this country 50 years ago with Let me start. Let me start it again. Now, don't don't just hear white immigrants. Remember, it's two different kinds of white people, right? And just use what we where we at, like what's in front of them, what they have at their disposal versus what they got from it. Check it out. White immigrants can come to this country 50 years ago with nickels and dimes and no education. And come here and pool their little nickels and dimes and no education, went to with, in fact, little stores, developed these stores into larger stores, developed this into an industry, which creates job opportunities for whites. Since Lincoln was supposed to have freed the black man a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. and today the black man, according to the government economist, has spending power of $20 billion per year. We feel that with the black man spending $20 billion a year, not setting up any businesses, not creating any industry, not creating any job opportunities for his own kind. He's not in a moral position to point the finger today at the white man and tell the white man that he's discriminating against him for not giving him a job in factories that he has he himself set up. Makes sense. If the black man has twenty billion dollars and these so-called Negro leaders got the cows that they can integrate white restaurants. 
and integrate white factories and integrate, force themselves into that which the white man has set up, they should use this same ingenuity to show the black people how to pool our wealth and set up something of our own. And then we don't have Makes sense? That makes sense to me. And all this complaining about this white oppression, white oppression. This is in 1965. Malcolm didn't make it out of the 60s, mind you. Um, Lincoln freed the slaves in 1865. The, the elder Thomas Sowell speaks about around the 50s and the 60s. Blacks were actually doing better than whites. And because these whites haven't been accounted for, these down and out, Basically, niggas, rednecks, you never hear these people being mentioned when they give the numbers of what America is about. Like, they don't exist. They're here. And you hear the story of the whites that you love or that trick you into loving them. You want to hear that, oh, the blacks are down and out. The blacks have been down and out. That's not what Malcolm is saying. This is in the 60s. 1965, y'all. Your mention of white immigrants just coming here proves the uh, inability of Negroes to solve this problem by the present course or the past course that they've been taking. What well, is true, Italians, French, Spanish, and others came here as immigrants, uneducated, poverty-stricken. And their parents were able to open up stores, little stores. They lived in the bank, sent their children to school. Their children studied business and came back Went and expanded the businesses. For and most reason. businesses in the white community today are called so-and-so brothers, so-and-so and so and so forth. This is how you establish what you call the not American just to go somewhat, uh, speaking on the run. Negroes have been here free since 1865, so-called, have a purchasing power of $20 billion per year. Did you know that? Have more education than any group, any minority group on this earth. Did you know that? You can't go in the Negro community anywhere in the Bay Area and find five businesses owned by Negroes, so-and-so and son, or so-and-so brothers. The, the mistake that we made differs from the uh, mistake you didn't make. Your parents solve your problems economically of their own volition, with their own ingenuity. Our leaders have done nothing to teach us how to spawn business. They've done nothing to teach us how to elevate the level of our schools. They've done nothing to teach us how to keep up the standard of our community. It is not the masses of black people who are at fault for this. It's this Negro puppet that the white liberal has set over the Negro community to act as our leader and act as our spokesman who has failed to show us how to solve our own problems so we remain crippled. Okay, so basically you're still sitting in these problems that you've had since back when, right? That's where we at. Let me um check back in. Let's get some. Where my history at? Where is that? Where is that? I hope it go right back to the place where we was at, y'all. Come on, goddammit. I didn't close it up. iPhone. Well, it's an old iPhone. It don't make a difference. It's the program. Y'all bullshit. Y'all know it. Come on, man. It's making me sit through all this shit now, y'all. Trying to make my point less cohesive. But y'all get where we was at. They was talking about all the cows that these people own. I could turn that shit down. <laughs> Vellum Southern Agriculture noted attempts to stimulate greater attention conclusions about the scarce of one of Frederick Law Olmsted's complaints during his travels through the antebellum there South we go. was the scarcity of butter despite all the cows he saw even among plantation owners he said as for butter some have heard of it some have seen it but few have eaten it hard data support his conclusions about the scarcity of butter in the antebellum South despite an abundance of cows. In 1860, the South had 40% of all the dairy cows in the country, but produced just 20% of the butter yes, and sir. only 1% of the cheese. As a study of antebellum Southern agriculture noted, attempts to stimulate greater attention to commercial production were futile, and even the bluegrass regions imported a large proportion of the cheese consumed. Mm. The study concluded, in short, while the South abounded in cattle, the reported production of dairy products was very small. A table based on census statistics shows that some of the southern states, such as Texas and Florida, 
had far more cattle per capita than important dairy states like Vermont and New York. And in most of the southern states, cattle per capita were nearly or quite as numerous as in the northern states. Yet the production of butter and cheese per capita in most of the southern states was insignificant as compared with per capita production in the principal northeastern states. A speaker before an agricultural society in Orange County, North Carolina said, it is a reproach to us as farmers and no little deduction from our wealth that we suffer the population of our towns and villages to supply themselves with butter from another Orange County Damn. in New York. In colonial times, butter was imported from as far away as Ireland, where butter was not imported. It was often produced locally by people of non-Southern origins. As a scholarly history of Southern Africa... This, uh, this the equivalent of having the, um, the Korean shops in your communities in your community, service in your community, and you mad at the Koreans that they take the opportunity to capitalize from being here in America. That's what this place is about. It's not for black people. It's not. Black people don't have a place in America. Um, Chinese people don't have a place here. Japanese people don't have a place here. Germans. This place is for everybody that dropped the flag because they didn't like what that flag had to offer government wise, not culturally, you know, you had people that was highlanders and lowlanders that were what? Scottish, but they lived in Scotland and they all claimed Scotland. They didn't claim black Scottish highlands. They, they were Scottish. They knew what they were culturally. Y'all don't get that here. You want to say that America is racist. No, it's not. America is lawless. America has no respect for the word of God. Y'all want to pin it on everything else. You tried it. You're not going to get emancipated under being black. Men not supposed to be slaves anyway. That's punishment from God. But now, physically, you're free and you still can't move. What do you think that's from? Y'all had all these leaders. All that stuff y'all did. No result. How long have I been here? 55, 54 years how long have I been on this journey? I got here age 49. From 49 to almost 55, what's changed in my life? Some of y'all been here. Some of y'all seen it. The ones that haven't seen it, I've shown it. This is what I've come to understand. Not what's been taught to me for generation and generation or whatever and didn't have any fruit. So when I denounced and dropped all this shit the society built up in me, then I could start seeing clear. Some of y'all love it and you, you act like you don't. Everything about it is what you govern yourself on. I de-govern, like that's what the word of God do. Y'all saying, no, I need this to be governed by. I need, I need this to be governed by. I say stuff on purpose. Y'all hear me and then just say, fuck what he talking about. That's cool. Then you prove something different. Otherwise, you're a fucking fool. Like, I don't listen to people emotionally. You can be as passionate as about being wrong as you want. You're wrong. You can be arrogant and you're wrong. I don't care. I'm arrogant too. But I'm right. And I'm right because I've shown I'm right. Not because I want to be right because I'm Evan. I'm big. I'm this. I got more guns. That don't make you right. You know it. You can shoot somebody dead and be wrong as fuck. You're still wrong. That's the premise what I live on. And the people in my life know that about me. I don't have to change that. They gravitate towards that about me. So I have everybody in my life that I need based on me being Evan. That's what the creator supply me with. And those people in need of Evan in their life. You know, so it's easy to push motherfuckers away with the truth now. It's a lot more peaceful life. Everybody that's following or that that come to the channels because they come to hear information that they may not have known and they willing to take it in and use it to be fruitful. You know, in the comments, if y'all saying anything opposite to what I'm saying, like you have to ask yourself why. You have to ask yourself why I matter. What what's it hurt? Again, I shouted out sign at a TV because I used to follow that bullshit every day. And recently, I just stopped back past, like I said, and saw that shit. I'm like, thank you, Sinatta, for not fucking with me the way you did. I having the creator put whatever. And his thing is the most high ain't shit. Like, the whole nine yards. And, and I understand that now. The people that was on there banging against the Hebrew Israelites, they 100% right, correct about 
it being fabricated. You know, they were the Shaka almost, the Garfields, the Reggies. They were right. But they were also wrong about the whole African thing because that's lies just as much as the Hebrew diaspora shit is made up. So they took one lie and destroyed another one. They was going to hold on to their lie. Let me say it's like this. No graven images. Not just slave masters. No graven images. Harriet Tubman. So these niggas will be like, oh, fuck the white statues. And the black ones are okay. Non-equitable. Ain't nothing equitable equitable about a statue. None of us are supposed to have grieving images. Y'all mesmerized by it. We can't trust people that's trying to explain why a building, a fucking brick building has significance. Other than providing shelter from outside, get the fuck out my face, dog. So this is the creator, the divinity, breaking down all that shit that y'all build up on your mansions, your yard. I don't give a fuck about it. You ain't using it to house nobody or give anybody else. That's for you. That suit you. You're not special. No matter how much fucking money you got. You know, if you're going through the state of somebody to say, hey, I'm going to help that way, you phony as shit. I don't even like the homeless. You know, I know they homeless for a reason. But I also know what the creator said. I also, you won't see me giving shit, but that's a part of Torah. So I'm going to say that's what's happening. And if I'm lying... Y'all can't punish me. It ain't one of y'all got the power to give me cancer. None of y'all. That's that's how I take man and what they feel about me. I'm like, what, you gonna get mad? Wish some shit on me? Wish it on me. See how it work out. See if it pop back up in your life. That's the certainty that I had with Allah. While y'all walking around trying to figure shit out because man got y'all confused. I'm like, I don't need man to know who and what I am. And I actually share that through bits and pieces of stuff just like this. This is tangible. This isn't something that's spiritual. But stuff like this prove that people are not spiritual. You can't change. You can't overcome your emotions to take in facts because you have a destination that you got planned already, right? You're going to be the best. Be that. That has nothing to do with your behavior per God. You know, you could you could be whatever and still keep the morality it don't get in the way of that unless your your job is something outside the line with the creative dean orderly for society and most people don't know you haven't read enough word of mouth tradition frederick douglas Harriet you tell me nat turner all that shit is fake fraudulent and it didn't exist and if y'all saying it did exist then tell me why Tell me how it existed, because those are just names to me. If they didn't change history, if they didn't change the future, whatever, they don't mean anything. More fucking idolatry. So fuck Frederick. Fuck Marcus. Fuck all of those messiahs that they gave you to pray upon and say, if only they were here, we could change it. But where was they at when I when I was proceeding to change? No driver's license, no taxes. So where were they at? Did I... Did I say in the name of Frederick Douglass? Ah, didn't. So this oppression that y'all talk about, this systemic racism, it's all up here. Every kind of way you can imagine, it's up here, all right? So peace. Shalom alaikum, alhamdulillah, mashallah. Uh, I'll pick up with, this is the origin of Black American culture, any Barnix by um, Thomas Sowell. It's on Thomas Sowell TV. Check that out as well as other things. It's y'all job, man. Why y'all mad if white people were oppressive for oppressing you? Like, if you can explain it, shouldn't you be able to change it? And you've been explaining it since the 60s. It's no change now. With, with all the information you know, every fucking excuse-making so-called intelligent black keeps saying, oh, they tricked us, they tricked us. Blacks with platforms, they tricked us, they tricked us. But well, why don't y'all show them what the trick is so they can stop the fucking abracadabra. And you can put the hocus pocus on your fucking focus. Peace, y'all.